The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which, when translated, is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked, come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Well, good morning, Village Bible Church. It's great to have all of you here. And if you're joining us online, thanks for worshiping with us today. Uh, really looking forward to diving into this passage a little bit. And so I'm gonna invite you, if you didn't already, open your Bibles to John chapter one, because I want you to follow along uh, with where you, we are at this morning. Uh, as of this year, it's, a, it's astounding. There's 4.2 billion people that use social media. 4.2 billion people using social media. That's crazy. Um, and the wild thing about that is, is the, they say that the average user of social media right now is online for at least two and a half hours a day. I'm not saying that to guilt trip anybody because if that's the average, I know there's some of us who are on the north side of that average and some who are on the south side. But I'm sharing that because I want to prove a point here. We live in a day and age in which it's common for us to say, come and see, right? When our social media accounts, be it Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, WhatsApp, YouTube, you, TikTok for you people on the edge, whatever it may be, we're used to saying, come and see, right? We like to go online and see what's going on in other people's lives, updates with our loved ones and stuff. We like to be entertained. We'll share videos and pictures with other people to let them know what's going on in our lives. It is normal for us to say, come and see. Our passage today is really all about that. Come and see. Come and see who Jesus is. And that's what John is introducing us to here as we begin to look at Jesus' public ministry with his call of his first disciples. And so as we see these first few men begin to follow Jesus and we see his interaction with them and even just how he's uh, dealing with them and calling them, we, we see right away Jesus starting to reveal his plan of discipleship. Right at the very beginning, he's already instilling some of these core beliefs about what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. 
Uh, John, the gospel writer, is going to introduce some themes for us today that he's going to kind of build on and expound throughout the rest of the gospel. We see them just introduced, just a taste of them even before us. At the beginning of our passage today, we see John the Baptist, who again affirms that Jesus is the Lamb of God. But this time, the interesting thing is he's got two of his disciples with them. And these two disciples leave John to go start following Jesus. Now, we're not dealing with the whole, you know, sheep swapping idea that we might see in churches today where a believer may go from one church to another to follow a more prestigious pastor or teacher. But what I think we're seeing is the fulfillment of John the Baptist's ministry. If you'll recall from last week, John the Baptist did not come to witness to himself. He didn't come with the goal of elevating his own ministry, but he came with the singular goal of pointing ahead to the Christ, the one who was promised to come after him, the one who would be greater than he is. He didn't take the credit and honor for himself. And so here as he's affirming and saying, look, the Lamb of God and his disciples go and follow that Lamb of God, it's them being true to John's teachings that it's not about him, it's about Jesus. And so right away we're seeing this idea of discipleship, what it means to follow Christ, literally following him. Now when John will use this term follow throughout his gospel, most of the time he's going to use it in terms of following someone as a disciple. However, right here uh, in our passage today, it seems that these two men, Andrew and the unnamed disciple, are following Jesus in the most literal sense of the word. And Jesus turns around and asks them this question, what are you seeking? Now, I, I always like to try to put ourselves in the context a little bit here. So in our modern day, if you were to have two guys following you, you might ask them something else other than what are you seeking? You know, but Jesus, so kind, turns to these two men and says, what are you, what are you looking for? As if to get to the heart of what these guys are really after. And their response is kind of strange if you think about it. Because their response to Jesus isn't to say, well, John the Baptist said you're the Lamb of God. Their response wasn't to say, we want to see if you're the Messiah. They answer him and say, Rabbi, which John translates for us, meaning teacher, where are you staying? And as if two guys following someone wasn't creepy enough, now they're asking where he's going to stay overnight. And Jesus, so kind, so gracious, obviously with his full knowledge of what's going on and what's ahead, says, come and see. So these young men followed Jesus. But when they ask him, where are you staying? I think there was a lot packed into that that they didn't even realize yet. They had the desire to go and be with Jesus. They did. They wanted to see what is he all about? Who is this Lamb of God? They wanted to be with him. And that same term, staying, is one of those themes that John is going to unpack and continue to put before us throughout this whole gospel. It's the same term that in John 15, Jesus says that we must abide in him. I think these young men had no clue of really what they were asking Jesus right then and there. It kind of reminds me of when I started playing basketball as a kid. As a little kid, I grew up watching the varsity guys play all the time. I loved it. And I was eager to get on the court and play for myself. So when fifth grade came around and the team was opened up, I was so excited to play basketball. I just wanted to get on the court and play. I wanted to make a bucket. I wanted to be the person that everyone clapped for. But little did I know as a fifth grader, all that basketball would come to mean to me over those next eight years of my life. I had no clue at that point all that the game of basketball would teach me about life. I had no idea the great joys and difficulties that would come along my way from playing basketball. But I was eager to get started. And I think that's what we're seeing here with these young men, with Andrew and this unnamed disciple. They, they didn't know what all was in store for them. They had no clue. When we read the Gospel of John here in this passage, we're uh, coming at it with the perspective of knowing the rest of the Gospel. They didn't. This is brand new to them. A new guy, a Lamb of God, they, they were curious. But little did they know all that would be in store, all that Jesus would teach them all the things that they would experience in walking with him, in being with him, 
all the things that would come that is difficulties and joys, all that comes with being a disciple of Jesus Christ lay ahead of them. And they had no idea yet of all that was to come. But Jesus did. And Jesus says, come and see. And I believe for us today, we're posed with that same exact question. What are you seeking? What are you seeking as you come to the Lord? What are you seeking in a Messiah, a Savior? What are you seeking in Jesus Christ? Get to the heart of the issue. Get to the heart of it and come and see who Jesus truly is. That he is the Lamb of God. That he is the Messiah that was promised in the Old Testament. And his invitation to come and see, I believe, is an open one. One that we can still extend to other people today. One that's invited for us. You'll notice in our passage, we've got Andrew here. Uh, that Jesus calls and Andrew and this other disciple, he says, follow me. And Andrew's first response is to go and find his brother Simon. Later, Jesus will call Philip to follow him. And what's Philip's response? To go get Nathaniel. Say, come on, guys, we have found him. We found the Messiah. Philip says that he found the one that Moses uh, in the law and all the prophets talked about. You've got to come and check this out. And that's an opportunity that we have today as his disciples in the modern world to go and to invite other people to come and see who Jesus is. And the beautiful thing about our faith that sets it apart from the other religions of the world is we are not inviting people to come and change their worldview or ideology. Those things will come. But what we are inviting people to do is to come and meet someone, not something. We are able to say, come and meet Jesus. Come and see who he is. We found the Messiah. That's not a threatening thing. That's a that's an open invitation. Come and see the Lord. What opportunities do we have to extend that invitation to the world around us? To your loved ones, your friends, your co-workers, your neighbors. We don't have to overcomplicate it. Come and see. Come and see. Let Jesus do all the hard work in changing their hearts and minds. That's his job description. Ours is to invite. But what an opportunity we have. How could we not in view of who he is? So Andrew invites his brother Simon saying, we found the Messiah. And so uh, Simon's like, all right, let's go check this out. And so uh, Andrew brings Simon to Jesus. And Jesus right away changes his name to Peter, to Cephas, right? And that name holds special meaning in my heart right now because my son's name is not Cephas, that Might be a little weird, but his name's Peter, right? And we love Peter, but uh, for us, a name is part of our identity, isn't it? My name's Jeremy, and that's as much a part of my identity as it is that you guys call me Jeremy. But for them, a a name meant something about who they were. It said something about them. And so for Simon to come up to this stranger that he's never met before, And for Jesus to say, you're Simon, and we'll call you Cephas, Peter. You could almost imagine him being like, okay, I don't get the nicknames here. Like, do I look like a rock to you or something or what? Certainly, Peter didn't have any clue of all that would come from that change in his identity. It wouldn't be till later in Jesus' ministry, later in Jesus' relationship with Peter, that he would say, this is Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. But he didn't tell him that up front. He gave Peter time to walk with him, to grow. Jesus knew all that he had in store. Peter didn't, but he had an invitation to come and see, and an invitation to come and walk with Christ. And isn't that true for us? That when we come to the Lord and place our trust in him and follow him as his disciple, we change. Well, I don't think anybody in this room or anybody uh, participating online probably has changed your name as a result of following Jesus. Certainly, you have changed. Jesus has changed who you are. Right away in this gospel, John says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Your familial status with God has changed because of Jesus Because of following him, it changes who we are down to the core of our beings. Jesus is a a savior who transforms. But not only was Peter's identity changed, but Nathaniel's perspective was changed. Now, 
Philip comes and says, we found the one, not someone, but the one. And Nathaniel's response, as we probably all remember it so clearly, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And just for a side comment, this doesn't really have much to do with the passage, but this is my own speculation. I, I wonder if as time went on, you know, Jesus performs a miracle or something, and one of the guys goes, nothing good from Nazareth, huh? Right? I just know I'd probably do that with my friends. Or, you know, Jesus does something, looks at Nathaniel with that look, like, nothing good. We, we're in, he's just like, man, little did I know. Right? I just like to put myself in the, in the context a little bit here. And so Nathaniel's coming up, and Jesus sees him approaching and says, man, an Israelite in whom there's no deceit. An Israelite in whom there's no deceit. And if somebody said that of us today, most of the time we're a little bashful with that. Oh, I don't know, whatever. Don't play it up too much. But Nathaniel, Nathaniel. yep, now how do you know me? Right? He's like, yeah, you're right. You know, just kind of straight to the point. And Jesus answered him and said, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, we don't know where that fig tree was. We don't know what Nathaniel was doing underneath that fig tree. We don't know what he was thinking. Was he praying? We don't know. But what we do know is that that statement was enough to show Nathaniel, I am the Son of God. He realized that Jesus knew him in a way that no other, how could he have known? He must be God. And some of us have had similar experiences that perhaps we had our doubts before coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Perhaps you have doubts today. And God at some point in your life spoke into your life in such a way that you were like, it must be him. And Nathaniel's whole perspective changed. He goes right from there and he declares, Rabbi, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. And it's in Nathaniel's response to Jesus that we see really what will become the profession of discipleship. What does it mean to follow Jesus? There is a profession to following him. Now, all of these guys had a profession of their faith in Jesus Christ, though little at the beginning. You know, Andrew goes to Simon, we found the Messiah. Simon comes to Jesus and follows him. Philip goes and says, he checks all the boxes. He's the one that the Old Testament has spoken of. He's legit. Nathaniel comes and he professes this to be true. There is a profession of faith in Christ. We don't just follow willy-nilly. We follow Jesus because of who he is. There's a recognition of that. And so as you look uh, at Simon's, uh, Simon's profession, you look at what he has said, and such is our profession of faith, or it ought to be. Jesus, you are my rabbi. Jesus, you're my teacher. I'm your student. I'm your pupil. That means I submit to you. What you say, I follow. Where you go, I come with. I'm submitting to you to live as you would live. Jesus, you're the son of God. That though we may not ever always fully understand who Jesus is or what Jesus is up to, we submit to the fact that we know you are God and I will follow you. That you alone have supreme authority. That Jesus, you're my king. And as my king, I live for your glory, for your kingdom, not my own. I live for your recognition under your terms because you are the king. You are the one who is sovereign. You are the one who has glory and we follow him. Such is the profession of faith the profession of discipleship. And with Jesus as our king, we recognize that we've entered into a kingdom unlike any kingdom of this earth, a kingdom that doesn't belong to this earth, but a heavenly one, one that Jesus will say later in Matthew 13, that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he sells all that he has and he buys that field. To find the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is to find a treasure that cannot be compared with anything of this world. A, a treasure so much more valuable that we would give everything to be there. So when Jesus says, come and see, follow me, is there something that stands in your way? Is there some part of your life that you're holding on to that is part of your kingdom? Or do you recognize the invitation as one so valuable that you'd give everything 
to follow Jesus. No doubt in their budding relationship with Jesus, these guys have just met him. They just met the Messiah. They don't have any level of expertise in all of this, but they've just met Jesus. And I'm sure they didn't understand fully all the things that they were saying. But they had experienced and came to know something that was true of Jesus Christ. And they follow. And Jesus has so much to teach them. I love how this passage concludes for us today. Jesus says to Nathaniel, well, so just because I told you that about the whole fig tree thing, that's what caused you to believe. Jesus, in effect, says at the end of verse 50, you'll see greater things. Than He's saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. Follow me and you will see so much more. And look at what he says. Jesus gives us in verse 51 the promise of discipleship. Jesus says to them, truly, truly, I say to you. And right there when he says truly, truly, it is to certify the validity of what Jesus is about. He's like, listen up. What I'm about to say is important. And he says to you, your Bible probably has the note in there as well, that that you is plural, not singular, which means Jesus has shifted this conversation from one-on-one with Nathaniel to the group of gentlemen that are with him, and in turn, us today. He says, you will see the heaven opened up and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Wow. And for any true Israelite, which Jesus just affirmed in Nathaniel, that certainly would have started to ring some bells. The heavens open and the angels ascending and descending. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 28. This is certainly where their minds would have gone as they heard Jesus make these claims of himself and I think we've got to look at it if we're going to understand what Jesus is really saying here. And so Genesis chapter 28, we are introduced to uh, Jacob's dream, if you're familiar with that. If you're not, let me give you a little context to where we're at. Jacob had an older brother, Esau. He cheated him twice, stole his birthright, uh, and stole the blessing from their father, Isaac. Esau's, rightfully so, pretty ticked off. Jacob's mom says, you better get out of here for a little while. Your brother might kill you, okay? So go up to Haran, it's really far away, and wait for your brother's fury to kind of die out. So Jacob leaves, and while he's on this long journey, he stops to stay overnight, and while he's sleeping, it says that he has a dream. And that's where we're going to pick up in Genesis chapter 28, starting in verse 12. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Does that start to sound familiar? And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. What is Jesus claiming? Look at verse 13 with me there in Genesis again. He says that the land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. In Jacob's dream, God was revealing to him the promised land. This is the promised land for the people of Israel. Now what Jesus is saying is in turn that he is not the promised land but the promised Messiah who will deliver God's people not just to the land but to heaven itself. That Jesus is the one that was foretold, verse 14, who will bless all the nations of the earth through the seed of Jacob. Jesus is saying in effect, guys, You follow me, and you are going to see heaven itself affirm that I am the Son of Man, that I am the Messiah, the promised one. You will see these things attested to in what's to come. And John does so. Throughout the rest of his gospel, he's going to share signs. He's going to share the teachings of Jesus Christ with one purpose in mind, so that we might believe and have life in him. 
That is the purpose of this gospel. And Jesus is claiming these things. And you got to wonder the curiosity that is peaked in these young men who are listening. Say what, Jesus? But one of the beautiful things, I think, is the open-endedness that Jesus leaves here. Because if you follow it a little further in Genesis chapter 28, in verse 16, Jacob wakes up from his dream. And in verse 16, Jacob says, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And perhaps that's the tragedy of Jacob's life before this moment. The Lord's here, and I didn't know it. And I wonder at times if this could ever be said of the church, Christians today. That God's in our midst, but we didn't even know it. That you go to work and God's there, but do you know it? That for some of you, you go to school, God's there, but do you know it? That you engage in activities in your communities, God's there, but do you know it? God is with us, and I pray that 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 doesn't even creep into these times where we gather as his people. That when we come and are here together, that we would recognize the presence of our God with us. That we would not like Jacob, but we would recognize that God is here in our midst. But Jacob goes on from there. In verse 17, it says that he was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And I wonder, I just wonder if Jesus didn't leave that statement a little open-ended with his disciples they might think back to how Jacob responded. Will they, like Jacob, realize that God is in their midst? Will they, like Jacob, realize that and respond in worship as they bask in the presence of God in the person of Christ Jesus? Will they, like Jacob, realize that the Son of Man, Jesus himself, is the true gate to heaven by which there is no other way to the Father but through Jesus Christ? Will they understand this? Brothers and sisters, will we understand this? Will we grasp these things to be true? Because Jesus says there is something great to see as we follow him. We are invited to see these very same things. And so as we continue in a study through the whole gospel of John, there are going to be times where we are familiar with Jesus' teachings. We're familiar with the stories that are told. But we must not become dull to these things. Guys, there's nothing mundane or dull about seeing God himself at work in his creation. These things are written for us that we might have a wonder, that we might worship Jesus for who he truly is that we too might see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man, that we might know that Jesus is the Messiah, that we might worship him and that we might follow him. And so today, you are invited to engage in Jesus' plan of discipleship, to come and see, follow him, walk with him, listen to him, learn from him. Today, you are invited to make your own profession of discipleship. Who is Jesus? How do you see Jesus? Will you follow him for who he truly is? Today you are invited to enjoy the promise of discipleship. To have your mind blown at the greatness of our Savior. To be caught up in his wonder. To be caught up in his glory. To be enamored at just how merciful and kind and welcoming he is. Yet how strong and mighty and powerful the, the fullness of God in man to walk with him. My prayer is that as we continue in this study through John, that we might not brush things off, but that we would look at this with an open heart and open minds. My prayer is that God would bless us richly in the knowledge of his son and our fellowship with him, that we would walk in the light as he is in the light. So for as a matter of fact, he is the light. And it is to him be the glory, the honor forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We come before you and we hear your invitation to come and see. And for many of us, we have. We've been walking with you for, for years, for maybe most of our lives even. Yet, Lord, how could we grow dull and 
appreciating who you are. Here's John looking back decades to Jesus' life and ministry, still enamored at just how great his Savior is. Lord, as we continue in this study, may, may you meet us in our place. May you meet us in our hearts. Continue to open our eyes. Continue to fulfill that promise that we would see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Or that we might walk by faith. Father, give us opportunities to go and to invite others to come and see. That they too might know the joy of the kingdom of heaven. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. May you be with us this week. It's in Christ's name that we pray.